Hey everyone, we're back with another video. Today I'm solving this physics paper, 9702, variant 12, February, March 2021. The time for this paper is 1 hour 15 minutes. A few things have changed for 2022 though. We don't have electric fields anymore in our syllabus. It's been moved to the A2 content. Also, according to the threshold for variant 1, 2, A was at 26, B was at 23, C was at 19, D was at 16, and E was at 13. So, as you can see, the difference between each grade is around 3 to 4 marks. So, someone was saying in the comments that A star should be at like a similar distance from A as well, like something like 30 or 29. That's what uh, someone said. Uh, that might be a case. That might be a scenario. The Easter is actually hidden. The 90th percentile might be located here. But it's just safe to assume that uh, it's at the midpoint between the highest possible mark, 40, and 26. Okay, so there's a difference of 14. If you add 7 to this, you're going to get uh, 14 by 2 is 7. If you add 7 to 26, you're going to get 33, right? So, uh, it's safe to say that A star is located at 33 for this variant, okay? Or you could assume that it's at 29 or 30, that's fine as well. But I guess this is just safer. I'm not exactly sure, but this is probably how it's done. Mm, the mark for A actually represents the 80th percentile. Basically, if this is 0 marks, and this is 100%, yeah, if this is 0 and this is 40, and this is 20, right? So 26, a mark of 26 represents the 80th percentile. People who got more than 26 are above the 80th percentile, right? So yeah, logically, it might be at 30. 30 looks fine. But yeah, just to be safe, you can assume that it's at 33. Okay, let's begin. Starting with the first section of the video. Question 1 to 10. This is February, March 2021. Variant 1, 2, right? What is a reasonable estimate for the density of sand? So if you think about it, uh, you guys need to know the density of one object, okay? You, you guys need to know this. Uh, density of water okay so for water the density is 1000 kilograms per meter cube or that's actually one gram per cm cube that's the conversion okay so this is basically um 200 gram per cm cube this is 2000 gram per cm cube that's very dense this is 20 kilogram per meter cube and this is 2000 kilogram per meter cube so listen just think about this if you put sand on water, it will sink, basically. Sand sinks inside water, right? What does that mean? Sand is more dense than water. So it's obviously going to be greater than 1 or greater than 1,000 kilogram per meter cube, right? Now, the thing with 200 and 2,000 is that basically, that's too dense, right? 200 is 200 gram per cm cube is 200 times the density of water and 2000 is 2000 times right but what about 2000 kilogram per meter cube that shows us that sand is twice sand has a density of twice that of water right so that's a reasonable estimate so one should be d that's the best answer so let's move on to two now uh, which physical quantity could have units of newton second square per meter so acceleration is um, velocity by time, rate of change of velocity, so meter per second. In the second minus one, that's ms minus two, right? Now let's look at this unit, right? Newton, second square, meter to the power minus one. Newton is basically force and f is equal to ma. So that's kg ms minus two into second square into meter to the power minus one. So basically we can get rid of these, right? And we only end up with kg. Okay, we only end up with kg. 
So, w what do you guys understand by this? It, it, the unit has to be kg. So one isn't right. So uh, out of these four, which one has a unit of kg? That's mass, right? So two is c. Moving on to three. A velocity vector is shown. What are the components of the velocity vector in the norther uh, what northerly and easterly directions? Uh, it's the first time I'm hearing of those words. Um, okay. By the way, I've added some color coding to my videos. So red is for physics, blue is for chemistry, yellow is for biology, and green is for math. Okay. And just let me know what variants you want me to do next or which year specifically for physics, chemistry, and bio. Uh, I'll do those before your paper one exam, right? And I'm thinking of attaching a Google Doc in the comments so that uh, you can answer that to let me know what you guys want the most, right? So according to the geography, I'm seeing that um, most of you guys are from Pakistan, right? Followed by Bangladesh. Bangladesh is basically where I'm from. And then we have a lot of people from uh, Malaysia, UAE, and Saudi Arabia as well. But my main target population was actually the UK. Uh, but I haven't been able to get to too many people from UK yet. Yeah, but thank you guys for watching my videos. It means a lot because the channel is growing at a very uh, high rate. So hopefully I could help you guys. Anyway, moving on. For three, a velocity vector is shown. What are the components of the velocity vector in the northerly and easterly direction? Um, so basically remember, uh, if you want to find out components, the one with the angle is basically, the component with the angle is cos theta basically. So this one is 75 cos 30 and this one is 75 sine 30, right? 75 cos 30. That's um, 64.95 or 65 basically. So for north it's 65 and for east it's 75 sine 30. That's um, uh, 37.5 or 38. Okay. So let's see. 2, 3 is C. For 4, a micrometer screw gauge is used to measure the diameter of a copper wire. So hear me out, guys. The reading with the wire in position is shown in diagram 1. The wire is removed and the jaws of the micrometer are closed. The new reading is shown in diagram 2. Interesting. What is the diameter of the wire? So here's the thing. For a micrometer, you need to check if there's a zero error or not. Okay? That's your priority. You need to check if there's a zero error. So zero errors are of two types. They can be either positive or negative zero errors. As you can see from this diagram, uh, it's at 14. The thimble scale is at corresponds with the main scale at 14. Okay. So what type of error is this? Basically, there are two types of errors I just told you. If it was at zero, why don't I show you guys the diagram? Actually, wait, basically, if it corresponds with zero, basically there was no zero error. Since it's a positive value, we call it a positive zero error. And if it was an, at a negative value, like for example, if the scale was at, you know, how do I draw this? Basically, if this was zero, and if it corresponded with something like if zero was above here, and you know, maybe it was at um, 44, maybe, then that was a negative zero. So, what's the logic behind this? If it's at a positive zero, you need to subtract it at the end because the diameter of the wire that we are actually measuring due to this error will be higher than the true value. So, we need to make a, we need to, you know, make a consideration or allowance for that mistake, right? So how do we actually uh, get the reading? So this is 0, this is 1, this is 2, and this is 2.5. Since we crossed 2.5, we need to take 2.5, okay? We will be taking 2.5. And as you can see, like the reading that you cross, you need to take that value. 
Suppose this is 0 0.51, 1 0.52, 2.5. Since 2.5 is the last value we crossed, we need to take 2.5. And this corresponds to 9, right? So this is the uh, main reading. It's 2.5 plus um, 9 into 0 0.01. This is the micrometer constant, okay? So we are getting a value of 2.5 plus 9 into 0 0.01 that gives us an answer of 2.59 but this has the error right it has an error of 14 with it so we need since this is a positive zero error we need to subtract the error so 2.59 minus 14 into 0 0.01 so we're getting a value of 2.45 okay so 4 is b hopefully that makes sense Moving on to five, a student measures the current and the potential difference for a resistor in a circuit. The measurements are used to calculate the resistance of the resistor. What is the percentage uncertainty in the calculated resistance? You guys know the drill, right? V is equal to IR, R is equal to V by I. So R is actually equal to Oh, we just need the percentage uncertainty, right? So the percentage uncertainty in R is actually equal to the percentage uncertainty in V plus the percentage uncertainty in I. We don't need to convert the units, by the way. Okay, so that's basically uh, 0.1 by 500 plus 0 0.01 by 50 into 100. Let's do this. I'm getting a value of 0.04 percent. So 5 is actually D. Cool. Moving on. Four cars A, B, C, and D move from rest in a single line. The cars take the same time to accelerate to a velocity of 60 km per hour. The velocity time graphs are shown which car reaches the velocity of 60 km per hour in the shortest distance. Okay. So... They take the same time to accelerate to a velocity of 60. Which car uh, reaches a velocity of 60 km per hour in the shortest distance? Guys, basically, you guys need to understand that the area under the velocity time graph represents the distance. So, for A, look at this. The area under the graph is the highest. So, A travels, like, reaches that speed in the highest. It takes the highest distance to reach that speed. But look at this. Look at D. The area under the graph is so small, right? So it only, uh, you know, it, it takes the shortest distance. So, so D should be our answer, okay? D is the right answer because the area under the graph is the least. Moving on to 7. A cannon fires a cannonball with an initial speed V at an angle alpha to the horizontal. Which equation is correct for the maximum height H reached? Okay, so you need to understand that h is a vertical distance, so we need to use the vertical component of velocity. Okay, so let's begin. Um, the vertical component of velocity, vv, is actually, you know, a v sine alpha, right? So what equation should we use to find out h? We know that s is equal to ut plus half a t square, right? So we don't want time here. Time isn't appearing in any equation. So v square is equal to u square plus 2s, right? So your final velocity is 0 and the initial speed is v sine alpha square uh, minus 2gh. Why minus though? Because we are traveling up but gravity is directed downwards, right? So if you make h the subject, you end up with h is equal to v square sine alpha square divided by twice g or v sine alpha whole square divided by twice g so uh, c looks like our answer okay now let's move on to eight a ball strikes a horizontal surface with momentum p at an angle theta to the surface as shown the ball rebounds with the same magnitude of momentum at an angle theta to the surface the ball is in contact with the surface for time t what is the magnitude of the average resultant force acting on the ball during the collision hmm let's try to understand this so, you guys need to understand that this ball, right, uh, it has two components of momentum. 
a horizontal component and a vertical component. So initially the horizontal component is p sine theta to the right and in the final scenario it's still p sine theta to the right. So horizontal, sorry, I meant p cos theta to the right, okay? So the horizontal component, my bad, is p cos theta to the right initially and it's still p cos theta to the right at the end of the journey, okay? But what about the vertical component? Initially, the vertical component of momentum is actually p sine theta downwards. Let's consider that to be negative. And at the end, that's actually p sine theta upwards. So let's consider that to be positive. So let's find out the change in momentum. The change in momentum will actually be p sine theta minus minus p sine theta, right? Because final momentum minus initial, and there's a negative sign inherently, so minus minus plus. So it's p sine theta plus p sine theta, so 2p sine theta, and we know that force is the rate of change of momentum, so that's 2p sine theta divided by time t, so 8 is actually d. Moving on to 9, a skydiver who is falling vertically through the air opens his parachute, which row describes the velocity of the skydiver immediately after he opens his parachute. Okay. So listen guys, look at the diagram I've uh, drawn over here. So initially velocity increases, but at one point we reach terminal velocity, where air resistance is equal to weight. However, when you open the parachute, air resistance suddenly becomes greater than the weight. So the parachutist, the parachutist will decelerate, okay? The parachutist, the skydiver, is parachutist a word? I'm not sure really, but yeah, the skydiver basically um, decelerates. But look, what happens to the magnitude of velocity? It was at plus 60, now it's at like plus 30 or plus 40 or something. So the magnitude decreases for sure, okay? The magnitude of velocity cannot increase, it will actually decrease. So it's between A and C. Now look, um, you know what, this is a misconception. A lot of people believe that when the parachute is opened, the skydiver moves backwards. That's really not the case. Look at the velocity. It has remained positive throughout the journey. Has it ever gone below the axis? No. As long as your velocity is above the axis, it represents positive velocity. Velocity remains positive throughout the journey. It's just that the magnitude decreases. That means the skydiver will keep on going downwards just at a smaller rate. So the direction of velocity never changes. It's always downwards. This is what you guys need to understand. A deceleration means a decrease in velocity. A deceleration doesn't mean for sure that your direction of motion will change. Do you guys understand? That's really important. Now for 10. Let's try to understand this scenario. A stationary firework explodes into four fragments which travel in different directions in a horizontal plane. So the diagram shows the velocity and mass of each fragment. What is the speed of fragment X? So guys, since the firework was stationary initially, right? That means the initial momentum was zero. So after the explosion, the momentum the final momentum must also be zero. Now, how do we do that? Think of these as the axes, okay? So momentum must cancel out in all directions. So just think about it. Um, 10 into 300 must be equal to 15 into velocity v. Okay, because check this out. 300 into 20, right? 300 into 20 is actually equal to 25 into 240. Just try doing it. 25 into 240 is 6,000. This is also 6,000. So basically momentum cancelled out in this direction. So momentum must also cancel out in that direction. So 15 into V is equal to 10 into 300. If you solve it, 3,000 by 15 gives us a value of uh, 200. Okay, so V is equal to 200. 10 is A. Moving on to the second section of the video. Question 11 to 20. A particle with mass moves in a horizontal straight line through a uniform electric field in a vacuum. The electric field is vertical. So we don't have electric fields in our syllabus. There is a significant gravitational effect on the motion of the particle. Um, okay. So we don't have this actually. This is excluded from the syllabus. You don't need to do this, okay? 
Moving on to 12. Two parallel forces, each of magnitude f, act on a rod of length 5d, which uh, graph, uh, which diagram shows the position of the two forces that will produce the largest torque. So guys, torque is actually net moment. So basically, we are wanting a couple. So couples are basically forces of equal magnitude acting in opposite directions, okay? Acting in opposite. So basically, B and C are wrong in the first place because they are acting in the same direction, not opposite. Now, the formula for a couple is basically F into D. Do you guys get it? The force, one of the forces and the distance between them. For A, it's FD. For D, it's F into twice D, which is 2FD. This is the net moment in D. So D is the correct answer, okay? It's higher. Torque means net moment and uh, D has the largest torque. Now for 13. A uh, mass of 30 kg suspended from the end of a wire. A horizontal force F acts on the mass so that it is in equilibrium with the wire at an angle of 30 degrees to the vertical as shown. What is the magnitude F? Okay. It's in equilibrium. So net force is zero. You guys need to understand that. Okay. So basically, this is tension. Tension is acting like this. And this angle is 30 degrees. So the ball has weight, right? A weight of 30 into 9.81. So we can say that the component of tension, vertical component, T cos 30 into the weight. Sorry, T cos 30, the vertical component of tension, actually balances the weight mg. T cos 30 is equal to 30 into 9.81. Alright, so I'm getting a value of tension is equal to 339.8 newtons. Now, we want to find out the value of F, right? So, tension also has a horizontal component in this direction. So, we can say that T sine 30 balances F, right? So, calculate your answer into sine 30 gives us an answer of F is equal to 169.9 or 170 newtons basically. 13C should be the correct answer, okay? Moving on to 14. A balance is used to measure the mass m of a number of cylindrical metal rods of length l. All the metal rods have the same radius r. The graph shows the variation with l of m. The gradient of the graph is g. Which expression gives the density of the metal? Okay, so the gradient is actually m by l. And we know that density is equal to mass by volume. So this is a cylindrical metal rod. So for a cylinder, volume is pi r square h, right? Or in the context of this question, pi r square l, since the length of the cylinder is basically the height, right? So we are looking for density is equal to mass by volume or density. We're looking for density is equal to mass divided by pi r square l. This is what we're looking for, essentially. Now, if you think about it, m by l is the gradient, right? So if we substitute that inside here, what are we getting? d is equal to m by l into 1 by pi r square or d is equal to g by pi r square. Isn't that what we're looking for? So 14 is c, okay? Moving on to 15, two blocks x and y are on a horizontal friction less surface. The mass of block y is greater than that of block x. Block y has a spring attached to its end. The blocks are pushed together so that the spring is compressed between them and the blocks are held stationary as shown. When release the blocks move in opposite directions. After release the kinetic energy of block X must be equal to kinetic energy of block Y. Hmm. We aren't sure about that. Okay. Because the mass is greater. They don't have the same mass. So we are not sure if they have the same velocity. Like they don't clearly because to conserve momentum, uh, mass is different, so velocity must be different. So kinetic energy should not be the same. Next, after release the sum of kinetic energy is equal to, that makes no sense. Like there's no law about that. The total energy of the spring and the blocks immediately before release is zero. No, 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 no. The spring had elastic potential energy. The total energy of the spring and the blocks is equal to the energy needed to bring the blocks together. So now this makes sense. The blocks are pushed together so that the spring is compressed between them. Okay. When released, they move in opposite directions. So this will move in this direction, this will move to the left. So we are saying that the total energy of the spring in the blocks 
is equal to the energy needed to bring the blocks together. That is true. Because we gave some energy to bring them together, to compress them, right? So that energy is actually equal to the elastic potential energy stored in the spring. That's right, okay? So 416, a gas is contained in a cylinder by a movable piston. The cylinder has a circular cross-section of diameter 20. The pressure of the gas is 102 pascals and the piston is initially 30 centimeters from the base. So it expands. Now, uh, remember the when volume of gas increases basically work is done by the gas do you understand and the formula is p del v that's the uh, and pressure has to be constant for this uh, formula to work okay so the work done by the gas since it's expanding is actually the pressure 102 pascals into the change in volume which is you know uh, the change in length is 5 centimeter and the diameter is 20 so what about the radius the radius is 10 centimeter so what about the volume the volume should be pi r square h or pi into 10 square into 5 okay so that's 10 square into 5 so that's 500 500 pi okay so it's actually 500 pi cm cube to convert centimeter cube to meter cube you need to multiply by 10 power minus 6 so 500 into pi into 10 to the power minus 6 into 102 that's actually equal to 0 0.16 joules so the answer should be a 16 is a moving on to 17 the egg an egg of mass 25 grams falls vertically downwards from the surface of a table which is 900 millimeter above the ground air resistance is negligible why is the kinetic energy of the egg when it hits the ground hmm basically this is the table the egg falls down 900 millimeters so kinetic energy gp will be converted to ke basically right so the gp is actually mgh or 25 into 10 power minus 3 kgs into 9.81 into 3 into 900 into 10 to the power minus 3 okay so 25 into 10 to the power minus 3 into 900 into 10 to the power minus 3 into 9.81 it gives us a value of 0 0.22 joules so 17 should be b mm, this looks like an easy paper in my opinion i don't know why the threshold was at 26 for an A. No, that's fine. Typically, it's at 28, right? So, it's a bit difficult. Maybe due to COVID, uh, people didn't have good enough prep. Hopefully, you guys do for your exam next month, okay? So, make sure to study hard. An aircraft travels at a constant velocity of 90 meters per second in horizontal flight. Also, guys, remember to subscribe to the channel. Uh, like, 90% uh, of you guys are watching without subscribe, without being subscribed to the channel, right? So maybe you don't notice while watching because that's what happens to me most of the time while watching some other videos. So make sure you drop the sub drop a like and subscribe to the video. It would help me a lot, right? So an aircraft travels at a constant velocity of 90 meters per second in horizontal flight. The diagram shows the horizontal forces acting on the aircraft. Okay. The mass of the aircraft is 2000 kg. What is the power produced by the thrust force? Hmm. Basically, we're traveling at constant velocity of 90. So check this out, guys. P is equal to FV. Since we're traveling at constant velocity, the mass was given to trick you. Understood? Net force is zero. So thrust must be equal to drag at 2400. So power is equal to the driving force 2400 thrust into the velocity 90 this is it 2400 into 90 that's it 216000 or basically it's 2.2 into 10 to the power 1 2 3 4 5 5 watts 2.2 into 10 power 5 watts 18 is b 19 which expression is equal to stress stress is basically forced by cross sectional er area okay so 19 is b understood 20. A wire is stretched by applying increasing values of force F. For each value of force applied, the extension X is recorded. 
A force extension graph is plotted from the data obtained. Okay. A force extension graph is plotted from the data. Which statement about the area under the graph must be correct? It's basically the strain energy stored in the spring. Understood? It can be calculated as a half fx. So half fx is only valid when Hooke's law is up, uh, you know, maintained. So are we sure Hooke's law is up obeyed? We aren't sure, right? Like maybe the limit of proportionality is uh, ex uh, exceeded. So it can't be A. Like we're not sure that it's A. Maybe the limit of proportionality has been exceeded. Understood? So we're not sure about A. For B, it is the elastic potential energy stored in the stretched sample. Okay. It is the uh, work done in stretching the sample. It would be the same for any wire of the same matter. D is clearly wrong. Okay, so between B and C, what's the correct answer? I'll tell you why C is the best answer. Basically, it's the work done in stretching the sample. Maybe all the work you've done to stretch the sample hasn't been converted to the elastic potential energy of the wire. Maybe some of it is converted to some other form of energy. Understood? So not all energy you give in to stretch a wire is converted to its electric potential energy. It might be converted to some other form, okay? So that's why we're not sure about B. Like we're not sure for a fact that it's converted to elastic potential energy for 21. A progressive radio wave in a vacuum has frequency uh, 75 megahertz. What is the phase difference between two this is the third section, by the way, between two points on the wave that are 50 centimeters apart from each other. Basically, it's a radio wave. It falls in the electromagnetic spectrum, so it has a velocity of 3 into 10 power 8. So 3 into 10 to the power 8 is equal to 75 into 10 to the power 6. Megahertz is 10 to the power 6. So 3 into 10 to the power 8 is equal to 75 into 10 to the power 6 into wavelength lambda so we are finding out that after calculation lambda is 4 meters now 4 meters is equal to 400 centimeters so we know that 400 centimeters is actually equal to 360 degrees right so what about 50 meters or 50 centimeters i mean according to unitary method it should be 360 by 400 into 50 that gives us a value of how much exactly 360 by 400 into 50, 45 degrees, okay? So 21 is B. Which statement is correct for longitudinal waves but not correct for transverse? They can from stationary waves, wrong. Both of them can. They can only travel through a medium. This is true. Uh, transverse waves do not require a medium to travel, okay? Peaks and troughs. This is correct for transverse wave. And in C, this is correct for both. 23. A loudspeaker emitting a sound wave of a single frequency is placed a distance L from a reflecting surface as shown. Hmm. A station wave is formed with an anti note at the loudspeaker. Okay. What else? A microphone is moved from the loudspeaker to the reflector. Before the microphone reaches the reflector, it detects four points where the sound intensity intense sorry intensity is a minimum. Hmm. So minimum refers to a note. Before it reaches the reflector, it detects four points where the sound intensity is a minimum. So guys, you need to understand something. Basically, um, it, uh, the microphone is moved from the loudspeaker to the reflector, right? And at the reflector. And I mean, at the loudspeaker, we have an anti node that's written in the question. Now, before the microphone reaches the reflector, it detects four points where the sound intensity is a minimum. So, basically, at the reflector, there needs to be a node. This is a fixed thing, okay? And it detects four points where the sound intensity is a minimum between the reflector and the loudspeaker. So, these four points that they're talking about, the reflector isn't inclusive. Like there are four other points except the reflector. Do you guys understand? So it's basically like this node, anti node, node, anti node, node, anti node, node, 
antinode it's like this so these are the one two three four points that we are talking about actually okay these are the four points that we're talking about and at the reflector there's another node obviously okay so let's do the math now so node to node that's lambda by two node to node lambda by two node to node lambda by two node to node lambda by two and node to anti node is lambda by four so it's basically lambda by two four times plus lambda by four once so one by two into four plus one by four that gives us a value of nine by four lambda so the distance l is nine by four lambda so lambda is four l by nine basically so that matches with c 23 is c okay now a source so if you have a question like if you did consider the node at the reflector to be inclusive how would we know it's fine you would get an answer of 4l by 7 then that isn't in the option here it isn't in the option so you would uh, realize that you made a mistake okay so that's fine for 24 a sound of frequency f at point z is moving at steady speed the pattern of the emitted wavefronts is shown which show describes the frequencies of the sound herb heard by the station observers at x and y okay so listen at z wavelength i mean at y wavelength is higher so when wavelength increases frequency must decrease okay and at x compared to the original uh, the wavelength is much shorter so when wavelength decreases frequency increases so at x the frequency will be greater at x the frequency will be greater and at y the frequency will be less than the original frequency f do you understand the original frequency at z so 24 is c 25 what is not a possible value of wavelength so basically guys this is the ultimate sheet right i'm telling you multiple times from my other videos you need to memorize this okay just memorize the wavelengths now What is not a possible value for the wavelength of the named electromagnetic wave? Gamma rays, 10 to the power minus 13. That fits the criteria. X rays, 10 to the power minus 10. That's also fine. Infrared. So it's G, X, U, V, I, M, R. These two check out. Visible is at 10 to the power minus 7. So infrared should be at 10 to the power minus 6. That's also at 10 to the power minus 6 to minus 5. Okay, that's for infrared. It's at 10 to the power minus 6 to minus 5. Microwaves are at, you know, 10 to the power minus 3 or 10 to the power minus 2. So this is too short for microwaves. This actually falls in the infrared spectrum. So 25D is wrong, okay? 26. Two waves P and Q meet at a point X and superpose. Initially, the two waves meet at X in phase, zero phase difference, so that the resultant wave has an amplitude of 14 centimeters at that point. The phase difference between the two waves is then changed so that they meet at x with a phase difference of 180. The resultant wave now has an amplitude of 4 at x. What is the amplitude of one of the waves at point x? Hmm. So, guys, when they had zero phase difference, the resultant amplitude was 14. So, constructive superposition occurred and p, p plus q was equal to 14. Okay? Uh, now the phase difference between the two waves is then changed so that they meet at x with a phase difference of 180 so destructive superposition is occurring and the resultant wave now is 4 so it's like this p minus q is equal to 4 so these are our two simultaneous equations now you can solve these simultaneously 2p is equal to 18 p is equal to um, 9 so what about the other one? 9 minus Q is equal to 4. So 9 is equal to, I mean, Q is equal to 9 minus 4, 5. So one of them is 9, the other is 5. So we're going to look for 9 or 5 in our options. Since we got 5, this should be our answer, okay? So hopefully you guys understood. 27. A water wave is diffracted as it passes through a gap between two barriers in a ripple tank. The wave is observed to spread out as it moves through the gap. Which two factors both affect the amount of diffraction observed? The amplitude and frequency 
okay so basically remember these two factors determine how much is diffracted the width of the slit or gap and the wavelength of the wave okay the wavelength of incident wave and the width of the gap really important question and really common 27d two sources of microwaves p and q produce coherent waves with a phase difference of 180 the waves have the same wavelength lambda at the point s there is a minimum in the interference pattern produced by waves from the two sources the distance qs minus ps is called the path difference yeah obviously uh, which expression could represent the path difference so basically they're at two sources produce coherent waves with phase difference of 180 so we already have 180 phase difference from the beginning they are out of phase by 180 degrees okay so if they were to meet at a point you know where there's pad difference zero we would see destructive superposition because even though pad difference is zero the initial phase difference is 180 so we'd see destructive superposition okay so it's like this two factors depend on what pattern you'll be seeing the pad difference and the phase difference so even if the pad difference is zero, but the phase difference is 20 degrees, you're gonna see destructive superposition. Now, at the point is, we are seeing minimum. Do you understand? That means we're seeing destructive superposition. So the phase difference is for sure 20 degrees and we are seeing destructive. So the pad difference must be integer multiples of, you know, zero. And like, it, for, it needs to follow the formula for constructive superposition. Because if we got something like 0.5 lambda, which is destructive, 0.5 lambda and 180 would add up to give, you know, 360 degrees, which is constructive. So our goal here is to maintain destructive superposition, okay? So it's basically either lambda, twice lambda, thrice lambda, and so on. So the only criteria, the only one that fits our criteria is C, 28C. A beam of red laser light of wavelength 630 nanometers is incident normally on a diffraction grading of 600 lines per millimeter. The beam of red light is now replaced by a beam of blue light of wavelength 445. A replacement diffraction grading is used so that the first order maximum of the blue light appears at the same position on the screen as the first order maximum of the red light. Interesting. So d sin theta is equal to n lambda and n is equal to 1 by d capital N or d is equal to 1 by capital N clear so initially we had d is equal to 1 by 600 so you have two options either you can convert it this way 1 divided by 600 into 10 power 3 or you could do d is equal to 1 by 600 into 10 to the power minus 3 above okay your wish so basically 1 by 600 into 10 to the power minus 3 this is what i prefer into sine theta is equal to both of them are first order okay so initially what did we have what light do we have we have a uh, red light uh, is equal to n lambda 1 into lambda of how much exactly 633 now it's replaced by blue light okay so how many lines do we need so 1 by n into 10 to the power minus 3 into sine theta is equal to 1 into 445 okay so sine theta is a constant actually okay sine theta is a constant so we can write sine theta is equal to 633 into 600 right divide by this 10 to the power minus 3 over here or after you reciprocal it's actually into 10 to the power 3 over here right so this should be equal to sine theta is equal to 445 into n into 10 to the power 3 so we can equate these two 633 into 600 into 10 power 3 is equal to 445 into n into 10 to the power 3 so if you calculate this for n 633 into 600 divided by 445 is equal to 853 so the nearest answer is actually d so 29 should be d so 30 is from electric fields it's not in our syllabus anymore we have 31 though
to either the potential difference between the base of the cloud. Now E is equal to V by D. We need to use this formula. 31 is also excluded. Okay, so moving on to 32. I is equal to NAVQ. It's actually the number density of charge carriers or the number of charge carriers per unit volume. Okay, you guys need to remember that. 32 is D. Common question. 33. A cell of negligible internal resistance is connected to resistors R1, R2, and R3 as shown. The cell provides power to the circuit and power is dissipated in the resistors. Which word equation must be correct? Power dissipated in R1 is equal to power. Okay, basically look at this. This is a parallel circuit, okay? So R1 will be getting V and R2 and R3 combined will also be getting V. That we know for sure. Are they identical? No. Power dissipated in R1 is equal to power dissipated in R2 plus R3. Ha, like we don't know that, okay? Current is different, right? It's like V square by R1. And on that side, we have V square by R2 plus V square by R3. How are you so sure that these are going to be the same? We don't know. Power dissipated in R2 is equal to R3. We have no clue that this is equal to this, okay? Power output of cell is equal to power dissipated in R1, R2, and R3. Now, this is true. This is true. Because these three are getting power from the cell. So the power dissipated in the cell, which has negligible internal resistance, should be equal to the power dissipated in these three uh, resistors, okay? If there was internal resistance, though, this would have not been true, okay? Moving on to 34, a fixed resistor and a diode are connected in series to a battery of electromotive force 6, the negligible and in negligible internal resistance. The graph shows the variation with potential difference V of the current I for the diode. The current in the diode is 40 milliamperes. What is the resistance of the fixed resistor? 40 milliamps, right? Mm, voltage is at like, how much is this? This is 1.25, right? So this is at 1.2, I'm guessing. 1.2 volts. So if this gets 1.2 volts, this will be getting 6 minus 1.2, 4.8, right? 6 minus 1.2 is 4.8 volts. Now the current is known to be 40 milliamperes. V is equal to IR. R is equal to 4.8 volts by I. 40 into 10 to the power minus 3. 120. 34 B is 120. 35. An electrical cable consists of seven strands of uh, copper wire, each of diameter 0 0.3, connected in parallel. Okay. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. What is the potential difference between two points on the cable, a distance of 1 meters apart? Okay, so the distance is one meter apart so that's the length of the cable we know the resistivity and we know the current okay so let's find out the total resistance of these seven wires let's find out the resistance of one wire okay how much is that gonna be basically r is equal to rho l by a so rho is 1.72 into 10 to the power minus 8 into length is one meter and the area is gonna be diameter is 0.3 so radius is 0 0.15 millimeter okay so that's actually pi into 0.15 into 10 power minus 3 whole square okay so i'm getting something like for one wire it's 0 0.2433 now we need to find out the resistance of the whole thing the total resistance right so what's it gonna be 1 divided by the resistance of one wire plus the other wire and so on kind of like this right reciprocal what can we do directly 1 divided by 0 0.243 into 7 to the power minus 1 okay so we're getting a value of 0 0.03476 ohms. This is the total resistance. Now, uh, what is the potential difference between two points on the cable 
a distance one meter apart okay so we know that v is equal to ir and we know the total resistance so v is going to be equal to 13 amperes into the total resistance 0 0.03476 into 13 that gives us a value of 0 0.45 according to my calculator so i'm going to go with c and 35 is in fact c okay 36 A cell that has internal resistance is connected to a switch S and a variable register. A voltmeter is connected between the terminals of the cell as shown. When switch S is open, the voltmeter reads 1.5 volts. Okay. So guys, when the switch is open, no current is flowing, right? So we are actually getting the EMF of the battery. Okay, not the terminal PD, the EMF of the battery. But when you close the switch, as current flows through the battery, some heat will be lost in the internal resistance. You guys need to understand that. That's the terminal PD. The switch is then closed and the variable resistor is adjusted to have a resistance of 4 ohms. The voltmeter now reads a 0.75. So now we are getting the um, terminal PD. So the variable resistor is getting 0.75 uh, volts, okay? But the battery had a rating of 1.5 volts. What's happening to the rest? 1.5 minus 0 0.75? What happened to that? So basically, the 1.5 minus 0.75, if you do that, uh, that's also 0 0.75. 0 0.75 volts have been lost in the internal resistance. Now, if you look at the interesting fact, 1.5 has been divided equally between these two, right? 0 0.75 for the inter resistor and 0 0.75 for the variable resistor. So when this phenomenon happens, that means that both resistors, the internal resistor and the external resistance, resistor actually have the same resistance or else it wouldn't have been shared equally so it should also be 4 36 c 4 okay 37 a cell of air to modify force e and negligible internal resistance is connected into a circuit as shown the voltmeter has a very high resistance and reads a potential difference uh, v out okay so let's try to figure this out basically guys you need to understand that this is a junction right so these two resistors are in series actually these two are in series with this this circuit can be drawn in a simpler fashion let me show you this is what the circuit looks like they've just tricked you actually 2 ohms 12 ohms 4 ohms and we've actually put the voltmeter over here okay so let's try to get the gist right so this 12 ohm resistor will be getting the whole emf e but 2 and 4 combined will be getting e but 4 will not be getting e we can actually find out how much of e this 4 ohm resistor gets how potential divider 4 divided by 4 plus 2 into e how much is that 4 by 6 into e or two thirds of e okay this is actually two thirds of two thirds of e and this is getting E. So if we do the ratio of V out by E, two thirds of E by E, we're gonna get rid of E. We only end up with two by three. So 37 D is the answer. 38. A battery is connected to a potentiometer. The potentiometer consists of a uniform resistance wire and a sliding contact P. The potential difference V between the sliding contact P and the end Q of the wire is measured using a voltmeter. The sliding contact P is moved from end Q to end R of the wire. Sliding contact P is the distance measured from Q. Which graph shows the variation with distance D of the potential difference. So guys, uh, you guys know that V is equal to V is equal to IR. And this is a series circuit, right? And there are no other components in the circuit, only this wire. So current remains constant, right? It's just that we are taking a greater length. And R is equal to rho L by A. As you increase length, resistance also increases. So if we increase resistance, voltage also increases. And we can say that V is proportional to R because I is a constant here in the series circuit. So since it's proportional, we will be getting a straight line that passes through the origin. Understood? So 38 is A. All right, 39. The figure shows part of a chart of nuclides where neutron number is plotted against proton number. So, an unstable nuclide X decays by emitting an alpha particle. Which nuclide is formed by the decay of uh, nuclide X? So, X is like this. It has um, 
94 protons and 145 neutrons so 94 plus 145 is 239 okay so it has a mass number of 239 and it has you know 94 protons so after alpha decay it's going to turn into y maybe mass number will decrease by 4 and proton number will decrease by 2 okay so the new proton number is 92 and the new neutron number is 235 minus 92 143 so that's the interesting part about alpha decay both proton and neutron number decrease by 2 and mass number decreases by 4 so we're looking for 92 143 so our answer is b 39 b last one 40. The nuclei of common isotopes of hydrogen, helium, lithium, and beryllium are shown. Which nucleus contains equal numbers of up and down quarks? Okay, so hydrogen has one proton, so that's only up, up, down. That's wrong. For B, we have two protons and two neutrons, so let's go up, up, down, up, up, down, then down, down, up, down, down, up. In total, we have one, two, three, four, five, six up quarks and one two three four five six down quarks so 40b looks like our answer and that is it so guys that's it for the feb march paper uh variant one two i'm gonna link the paper for feb march uh 2022 up here right feb march 2022 paper one two and i'm gonna link the playlist for paper one up here if you want to see those and if you want to see other videos on 2021 i'm going to link the playlist for 2021 physics down here right it consists of all all paper one paper two and paper four and five variants all right and remember to subscribe to the channel if you like the content and i'll be dropping may june 2021 next okay and after that just uh, give me all requests any requests you want, I'll be solving those before your exam, okay? See you and take care.